Well, one of the things these numbers tell you, the eight that have got through to nominations, is they give you a bit of a clue how long this whole process is going to go on. We could be down by the end of tomorrow's ballot to four or five. We could be looking at this whole thing being resolved before Wednesday next week, which is the deadline that had been imposed on it. Immediately, the moment these nominations uh, get announced, you get rumours going around that the front runner, Rishi Sunak, has lent some of his MPs uh, to someone else to try and get them on. Jeremy Hunt was one of the uh, central accusations that was going around there, because famously in the past, this is how people have tried to make sure they work out who's in the field of play, where they look like they're, where they are in the spectrum, but also who's in the final runoff. I, I wouldn't read too much into that, but it's happening, and the focus is already turning into the, uh, onto the second preferences of the people who've got those yeah. eight onto the ballot paper. Where will they go when their favourite, their darling, um, fails? And on that front, you've got to be really careful looking at the list. Don't assume that just because a whole load of people are in the column of someone who, let's say, is for low tax and considered quite right-wing or whatever, don't assume that all those names will immediately go over to the other most right-wing figure who is closest to the line. Sometimes those names are there because they're friends, because they mm. work in the same ministry, uh, because they came into Parliament at the same time. All sorts of connections can sometimes mean that the other, uh, other candidates can actually get access to them. So a lot of churning still to come. We've had an interesting poll of Conservative members uh, tonight which sheds some light on what they might be thinking. And the impression you come away with is that we're not the first people to do this by any stretch, but I rather reckon Rishi Sunak's team was in before us, because that message which superficially uh, might seem uh, out of sorts with uh, uh, the, the, the membership, uh, talking about fair, uh, ta immediate tax cuts being fairytale economics, you get a flavour from this poll that actually that might be quite close to where quite a lot of the members are. Anyway, really important today, uh, the day of nominations, this is how it went. Many in the party wonder how long he's been getting ready for this moment. But today, the campaign was fully launched. Grant Shapps gave Rishi Sunak his support, his own campaign failing to get off the ground. Please welcome Rishi Sunak. And so did the Deputy Prime Minister, Dominic Raab. Rishi Sunak is the front-runner under attack from others behind him and trying to make peace with the man he helped to bring down. Was it no longer working? Yes, and that's why I resigned. But let me be clear, I will have no part in a rewriting of history that seeks to demonise Boris, exaggerate his faults or deny his efforts. Yeah. In the last hour, it was announced who's joining Rishi Sunak in the first ballot. Liz Truss, Penny Mordaunt, Tom Tugendhar, Kimi Badenoch, Jeremy Hunt, Suella Braverman and Nadim Zahawi have made the cut and got the necessary 20 nominations. Among those who failed to get the numbers were the former Health Secretary Sajid Javid, backbencher Reman Chisti, Home Secretary Priti Patel and the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps. Those eight will go to the first round uh, ballot uh, tomorrow between 1.30 and 3.30 uh, with the results announced uh, as soon as we can uh, after that. Thank you. At his launch, Rishi Sunak was trying to make capital out of the attacks his own fellow Tories are launching on him for failing to promise immediate tax cuts. We need a return to traditional Conservative economic values. And that means honesty and responsibility, not fairy tales. Yeah. I believe cutting taxes isn't a fairy tale, but rather a critical step to tackle the cost of living crisis. Rishi Sunak's warnings against early tax cuts didn't deter some of his rivals, and the Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, picked up the endorsement of two of Boris Johnson's most vocal defenders. When we discussed taxation, Liz was always opposed to Rishi's higher taxes. That again is proper conservatism, and I think she's got the character to lead the party and the nation. Looking at the array of people around Liz Truss, uh, Nadine Dorries, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Some people could say this looks like continuity Boris Johnson. Well, I mean, obviously, it's great that we've got people who are strong supporters of the Prime Minister, as I was. But uh, looking around Liz's campaign team, there are people from all wings of the party and all parts of the country. Penny Mordaunt's also picking up support amongst those who don't want Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss. Does Liz uh, Truss look a bit too sort of continuity Boris Johnson? To you? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not here to comment. Not enough of a break. I'm not here to, I'm not here to comment on, on other people. I mean, I think they're... There is an issue that people want a new start, 
But, you know, that's for them to choose which of these candidates deliver it. I, I'm in favour of a new start. I want, I want somebody who's going to pick this party trust up. Trust is broken and you need that. I'm, I'm, yeah, trust, trust uh, is broken. And we, ha and we have to re-win the hearts and minds of the people. And Penny's best place to do that. We brought together two of the country's most respected economic commentators. What do they make of the giant tax cuts proposed by some candidates? Some of the huge tax cuts that have been talked about, £50 billion by some of the candidates, would involve going back to austerity and some for some um, departments, particularly if you're also in favour of a larger army, which lots of people appear to be. He's, he's accusing his rivals, Rishi Sunak, of fairy tale economics, but he's saying he wants a smaller state, but not telling us how. There's a bit of a fairy tale there, is there? If you're going to say you want a smaller state, you do need to say something about what it is that you're intending to do to get there. Because you can't do it with salami slicing. It, you've got to look at big elements of the state that won't carry on doing what they're doing. I think it's pretty hard to see how you do it bit by bit. I mean, again, don't forget the scale of the cuts that we've seen since 2010. Historically unprecedented. Marks out of 10 for the economic debate in the Conservative leadership contest, engaging with reality so far. Well, I wouldn't even characterise it as an economic debate, in my honest. I mean, we, we've we've, we've, had, theory, we've had, a, we had a discussion about you know, wishful thinking about taxes. We've spent the last week uh, promising lots of tax cuts with nothing about the trade-offs that means for public services or for higher borrowing, and we haven't been straight with people in terms of what that would can actually plausibly do to boost growth or to solve the cost of living crisis. So if you're measuring it against that test, then we're talking naught out of ten. It's time for a clean start. It's time for Tom. Introduced by his own cabinet catch, the Trade Secretary, instant tax cuts were also on offer from the backbencher, Tom Tugendar, not so subtly alluding to his military past. When the moment demanded service, we delivered scandal. This is a crisis of purpose, of leadership and of trust. I'm sorry, but I cannot accept retreat. We should not accept retreat. We must return to service. Three launches were happening at the same time this morning. Amy Badenoch's campaign had a whiff of the seminar about it. We have been in the grip of an underlying economic, social, cultural and intellectual malaise. The right has lost its confidence and courage. The anti-woke champion had gender-neutral lose at her launch venue. But a Channel 4 News poll of Conservative members suggests culture wars aren't a big issue for them and their economic focus might not match some of the candidates. We asked just over 500 Conservative Party members which debates they were most passionate about. 43% said helping with the cost of living, 18% said tax levels, only 3% said transgender issues. Drilling down into the tax debate, while 29% wanted taxes down and spending trimmed, 38% wanted to keep taxes and spending about where they are. I think our members are very pragmatic, serious people. They, they run things, they are very much part of their community. They know you have to balance the books. Thank you all very much. Rishi Sunak still out in front on nominations today, the man to beat. And seven MPs now focused on doing just that. Gary Gibbon reporting. Well, with me now are two Tory MPs, Maria Miller, who's supporting Penny Morden's campaign, and Alan Cairns, who's backing Rishi Sunak. Thanks very much to both of you for coming here. Let me start with you, Alan. Um, I was really struck by the fact that Rishi Sunak, when he launched his campaign today, sort of said thank you almost to Boris Johnson for being such a remarkable and incredible politician. Is he worried that the ghost of Boris Johnson will haunt Rishi Sunak as the, the second man to wield the dagger exactly a week ago? No, I think it's about recognising what Boris did. I mean, I supported Boris right up until the end, until it became untenable. So uh, uh, Rishi Sunak did as well up until the day before, and therefore it came to a point where he felt that he needed to leave the Cabinet, and, and rightly so. So it is about recognising that we got Brexit done, the, the response to Ukraine, the response to Covid, but it's about continuing that momentum of those great policies, as well as, of course, bringing standards of governance uh, back to where we'd like them to be. 
But whatever Boris Johnson's faults may have been, when you talk to grassroots members of the Tory party, they're really worried about this sort of backstabbing in the party, and they don't, a lot of them just don't trust Rishi Sunak. Well, I don't see any backstabbing in the party. I think it's people that are passionate about uh, the country, passionate about doing the right thing, recognising the big challenges that we've got in front of us. I mean, there are global rises in costs of energy and in costs of food. There's a war going on in Europe. So these are serious times. Inflation uh, uh, globally is rising sharply, and we need to be able to respond to that. So my judgment was that uh, uh, there are very many good candidates there, uh, but it, ultimately Rishi Sunak demonstrated that he can respond to the big challenges during COVID, for example, furlough, where everyone was recognising uh, what he was doing to support uh, working people, working families, uh, and it's about uh, continuing that momentum and, of course, getting taxes down when the time is right. Uh, we'll talk about taxes in a minute. Maria Miller, I mean, Rishi Sunak has clocked up some pretty considerable experience even though he's a relatively young politician, Penny Morden can't really compete with that, can she? Well, look, I, I think, as Alan said, we've got a, a range of really well-qualified candidates. The reason I'm backing Penny is because she has such broad appeal. I mean, she has got experience at the highest level at, in the Cabinet, um, but also she has enormous appeal, not just in the party here in Parliament, but also amongst our activists and amongst our members. You know, what we want is a fresh start. Uh, I think we've had a difficult few years, and I think Penny brings that fresh start and she really does unite people. So one of the battlegrounds on which this campaign seems to be fought is taxation. Okay, So your man, Rishi Sunak, has said, we're going to stick with the taxes as they are and eventually we might bring them down. Isn't that being a little bit too honest? I mean, well, I don't think he's quite said how you've uh, presented it. His plan is, He's of course, not about to change his policy to bring the, taxes the, the, the plan, of course, is to make sure that inflation starts falling and then start reducing taxes. There's little point in adding to the inflationary pressures in the economy because all Conservatives, and I think all candidates would recognise, we need to get a grip on inflation and then it's about reducing taxes thereafter. But there's a lot of anger in Tory ranks, amongst the grassroots, amongst the population, that this is the highest taxation we've had since the 1940s. And I think then that's a communications challenge that we've got to explain the risks of reducing taxes now and what that would do to inflation and how we'd be worse off and interest rates would have to rise. And I think that the judgments that Rishi has made up until now demonstrates that when those big calls come, he is the one that has been ready to uh, borrow at the right times and to save money at the right times in order to get the economy back on track. Maria Miller, there's a sort of competition amongst the non-Rishi candidates to cut taxes faster and further. Penny Morden has promised a 50% reduction uh, in, the, in the fuel uh, tax. Uh, I think Tom Tugendhat promised 10% this morning. That's an awful lot of reduction. How is she going to pay for all the stuff that she wants to pay for? Well, the only announcement that's been made on tax so far is that one, and it's fully costed with the increase in revenue. But I think, Matt, you're absolutely right. We cannot have a situation where people are making policy on the hoof, and that's why Penny's been very clear um, to not have lots of policies made now in advance of her launch. But they're making promises on the hoof, aren't they? All candidates at the moment. And the candidate that I'm supporting is, is not doing that. And uh, to her launch tomorrow, she'll go into more details, and that's when you'll hear more about the approach that she'll take. But I think we need to be talking about approaches, uh, not the sort of policies that are going to leave us in difficult situations when we know the coffers are tight. Mm -hmm. And after all, we are a government which has a manifesto. Mm -hmm. um, and whilst the, uh, the, the candidate right. that Alan's supporting uh, obviously uh, wrote, uh, wrote the book when it came to the current tax policies, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we are following our manifesto commitments, which is to be a, a low tax party. That's important. Both your campaigns have hit some snags. Um, I mean, you've got Gavin Williamson working for you, the, you know, the former master of the dark arts, the man with the tarantula. Nadine Doris tweeted today that this is, you know, dirty tricks in dark arts. What do you say to that accusation? Well, I don't accept that for a, for a second. We're glad to get support from all walks of life, and Gavin Williamson is a hugely influential figure because he's so well organised. Uh, but so well organised in terms of finding, no, you know, no, no, well organised in, in running a positive campaign, and really? that is absolutely what Rishi wants to do. And I would say that other candidates from what my experience is when they've spoken to me because I only decided earlier today they've all been positive to me in their presentation they haven't been critical uh, of the other candidates so I think we're all on the same side there's a great choice of candidates out there I strongly believe okay. that Rishi Sunak is the best person to respond to the challenges very briefly uh, Johnny Peacock the Paralympian was on, on Penny Morden's launch video he asked immediately to be taken off 
uh, didn't want to endorse her. That's a bit embarrassing, isn't it? But what isn't embarrassing is the impact of that video. Um, it is an astonishing statement of what Penny is. She's an enthusiastic, positive individual mm. who wants to see our country to be the best it can be, not just because she's a presidential character, but because she believes... Presidential? In not because she's a presidential mm. character, but because she believes in teams of people working okay. together. And I'm sure she'd be working with, with all of us to make sure that our, our government and our country okay. can be the best it can be. We have to leave it there. Maria Miller, Alan Cairns, thank you very much indeed. Fatima. Well, that poll we featured a little earlier also asked Conservative members about levelling up. Only a third of them wanted to prioritise so-called left-behind towns. Well, how's that playing in those areas? I've been speaking to the Conservative Tees Valley Mayor, Ben Houchen. I started by asking him if he was disappointed that the Prime Minister is resigning. I mean, I'm very sad and disappointed that the Prime Minister's going. His commitment to levelling up, his commitment to Teesside, and when you look at the fact that we've got the Freeport, we've got the Treasury coming to Darlington, I think he's going to be a huge loss. But now we need to look to the future and find out of the contenders that are vying to be Prime Minister, which ones are going to commit to the same agenda of levelling up because it's a long-term plan and what we've not heard so far is any real commitment to that agenda, which is so crucial to the people that I represent. And which of the current crop has caught your eye? Well, it's a good question. I mean, my priority is making sure that the North is protected, that we continue with that investment, that we redouble our efforts on levelling up. And so far, we've not heard um, anything, as far as I can see, from any of the contenders about the agenda for levelling up. So I've written to all of the contenders, asking them to commit to a number of things as a minimum levelling up pledge, and I'm yet to hear back. So I'll tell you when I do, and that will absolutely inform who I choose to back in the leadership campaign. Well, the fact that not many of them have mentioned levelling up does suggest that perhaps Tory MPs maybe even the Tory membership, doesn't care about levelling up in the way that you do. Does that concern you? I, it massively concerns me that no leadership contenders talking about levelling up in any real form at the moment. I think there is also a bit of a herd mentality in London when all we're talking about at the minute is tax cuts and tax uh, stability. Now, that's important, but actually you can only really talk about those things when you have a fully fleshed out policy platform. So if we're going to commit to levelling up, that will require some money. So that might mean that we reduce taxes slightly less than we would like. But we've got to understand, well, if you're going to cut taxes, is what is the result? Do we cut services? Do we not invest in levelling up as uh, I would like to see? So again, it is absolutely a huge concern to me at the moment that we're not hearing anything from the contenders because I genuinely believe that the thing that got Boris Johnson his massive majority was obviously Brexit and his pitch to the country, but also levelling up. Uh, certainly to first-time Conservative voters and people who voted Labour for generations, it is a hugely important thing. And if we're not careful, and if it is sidelined as a major policy, then you can easily see large swathes of the north of England and those red wall areas going back uh, either to the Labour Party, but certainly away from the Conservative Party. I mean, you say Boris Johnson created a focus on levelling up. We hear, of course, today a report on child poverty saying the North East has now become the UK's hotspot for child poverty. That's incredibly worrying, and it doesn't suggest that levelling up has worked in any way. It's hugely worrying and it's why the policy is absolutely essential that it stays as a top priority of any future administration and future Prime Minister. I mean, levelling up in its truest form is going to take a long time. I mean, even the most optimistic of us would suggest it could take 15, 20 years to try and equalise the prosperity between the South and the North, to be able to tackle things like uh, wage discrepancies, to look at those generational issues around poverty. And this is not going to be fixed over two or three years. Now, we've made a, a basic start with some infrastructure projects. I think Teesside, it's fair to say, can boast that levelling up is probably the most successful thing we've seen uh, compared to anywhere else in the country. But that doesn't mean that it's finished. It's barely started, which is why it's so important that I'm calling for contenders to continue, continue to commit to it because it is a long, long-term plan if we want to make sure that the whole of the UK is a fairer place for people in the future. Ben Houchin, thank you very much for joining us.